Amen. All right, before the sermon begins, I want everybody to grab their hymnal real quick. So I should have been more diligent of this, but I wanted to explain something. We're singing songs. It's my job to make sure that these songs are <clears throat> doctrinally correct. And there is something that is incorrect. I don't know if anybody noticed it. So there are, yeah, there are two songs that we sang recently, and they're both found in the same location of the, of the hymnal. Or, uh, you know, somewhat at least, generally. So first turn to 227. So we sang this one tonight. I'm glad that people are picking up on this, but uh, I want you to turn to song number 227 in one hand. It's like we're you know, beginning a Bible study here as well. Uh, also get 166, song number 166. We just sang this the other day as well. Now, we, we are not going to necessarily stop singing these songs entirely. What we're going to do is omit these verses is what we're going to do. I want you to look first at 166. We'll do them in uh, numerical order. I will praise him. Song number 166 by M.J. Harris. This heretic. No, I'm just kidding. Verse number 5. It says, Glory, glory to the Father. Glory, glory to the Son. Glory, glory to the Spirit. Glory to the three in one. Anyone notice when we read that? When we were saying this last week? Okay, go to 227, Saved by the Blood. And I love this song. <clears throat> but when, because it was back to back, and I noticed it the other day as well, I was already going to say something afterwards. I wanted to publicly say something quickly so each person can recognize this. Now, 227 says, and it's the last verse as well, Saved by the blood of the crucified one, all hail to the Father, all hail to the Son. Almost identical. One just says glory, one says hail. All hail to the Spirit, and then it says this, the great three in one. Now, God is three in one. And I'm sure everyone is already familiar with this. I would hope that everyone would be. But the three in one is not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's Father, Word, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I want you to look at 1 John chapter number 5. And uh, there was a, some guy who recently left Faith Forward Baptist Church who had tried to, you know, he, I'm sure people saw this, he was slandering me and saying stupidity on Facebook. And I responded to him. And every time I brought up any scripture, he never said it. He wrote some scriptures at the end and I just didn't, you know, it, it was foolishness. But one thing that I brought up to him that, I've never heard anyone else po point this out. And I've read 1 John chapter number 5, or I have read 1 John chapter number 5, I don't know how many times before I ever noticed this. But the key passage of the Trinity is 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7, which reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then it says, And these three are one. So there are three... That, and I believe, and I have no problem with saying this, that coexist. There are three that coexist. The Father, God, it's used interchangeable in 1 John 1 and John 1. So the Father or God himself, the person, his word. So God is the person. The Father is the person. There's one God, the Father. That's the person. His word and his Holy Spirit. Makes perfect sense that it's so simple, right? Well, people will just say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh... Adam Fan, and this just popped into my mind, when he had made some videos in the past attacking me, he would just like quote 1 John 5, 7 and say, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, they bear record in heaven. Anybody remember seeing that? Yeah. That's not what this says. The Trinity is the Father, His Word, and the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Son was not with God. Because the Son is a specific reference to that same God being as a man. It's a reference to His flesh. The flesh was not there. Now, three and one, yeah, you can use that language, three and one. But what we want to say, I, I, I even like that language specifically because, do you know what Colossians says? In him, in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Think about that. There are three and one. The Trinity, you know, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, these three are one, and those three are in one, too. You know who they're in? They're in the Son. So there's a distinction there's two layers or levels of distinction. We need to make sure that we understand this. God has eternally existed as triune or a trinity. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. That's how these three bear record. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And uh, let me say this as a side note also. The further proof of that while we're in 1 John chapter number 5, I don't want to forget to uh, reference what I just alluded to a moment ago about the person who had attacked me on Facebook. You know, I told them, hey... Go back to 1 John chapter number 5 and reread that, and you'll see that it's actually the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost who are bearing record of the Son of God. 
So you know what you have? Another distinction. A second distinction. Do you know why? Because you have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, yes, dwelling inside of Jesus. That's why he says, I bear record of myself. And then he says, there's another that bears record of me, right? Yes, but you have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost in heaven. You have just God seated upon the throne, bearing record of his Son, who is that same God living as a man in the flesh. Amen. So it's wrong to say. That is, that is doctrinally incorrect, and I should have said something the other day. We're, we need to uh, try to, if I, if I choose this song again, song leaders, please, you know, uh, try to remember. We, I, I should just go through all of these hymnals and just mark. I'm going to do that. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a permanent marker, and I'm going to mark out that verse. We're not singing those verses any longer at this church because it's not correct. It's doctrinally in error because the three in one is not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost in one. That is, that's, that's, when you really understand what son means, it sounds foolish. It just shows, you know, that there's, there's a disconnect when it comes to understanding this doctrine and the authorship of these particular, you know, hymns. So, I'm sure everyone understands that what I was saying, but I wanted to point that out specifically. And that, we sing these hymns because they're doctrinal, but guess what? If they're not doctrinal, we're not singing them. So, when we, if, you, if you catch a song, come to me. Just, the song leaders will do that from time to time. They'll come to me and they'll say, hey, I noticed this. What do you think about this? And sometimes I'll say, well, it can, it, it's not specifically talking about salvation. Maybe it's a salvation issue. So maybe they just mean in your life, you know, you're living your life and doing good works. Then sometimes what we will say, let's scratch the song. Let's sing. I don't really, even if it's, you know, if, if it seems to imply that, then let's just scratch the song and not sing it. So we're not singing those verses any longer because the Trinity is the Father, that's God, the person, His Word, and His Holy Spirit. And those three are in one. They're in the man. They're in the man, Christ Jesus, the flesh, the body. Amen. That's the three in one, if you want to say three in one. That language actually is not in the Bible specifically. These three are one because that's the overlap. There's three, but at the very same time, they are one. They, are, they coexist, but they are one at the very same time. So you need to understand those two levels of distinction. You have God just in his deity, God, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Then you have that God, which is triune, inside of the man Christ Jesus, taking on a secondary distinction as the Son, which is distinct from the three, as far as the triune nature Amen. goes. Let's go to, back to Genesis chapter number 16. Genesis chapter number 16. <coughs> Genesis chapter number 16 tonight in our weekly Bible study. So Genesis chapter number 15 uh, was a very profound chapter because it was the salvation of Abraham, who is, you know, the Jew of all Jews, right? He's the father of the Jews, isn't he? He's the father of the nation of Israel, which the promise was, you know, uh, uh, specifically given to Abraham after it seemed as if uh, the promise had kind of fallen off the map for a while. Of course, it was uh, given to Noah, generations went by, and then God chose out of that seed, of that lineage, he chose out Abraham. And then, uh, you know, brought that promise back up, brought him from, you know, uh, of the Messiah, brought him from his land and took him, you know, into Canaan, which would be the land of Israel. So here in Genesis chapter number 16, before we dive too much into this chapter, I want to get the timeline for you so you don't become confused. At the very end of this chapter, verse number 16 we find out the age of Abraham. I want you to know where Abram at this time before his name was changed. In uh, chapter number 16, verse number 16, the Bible says this, And Abram was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Now when you read in your Bible and it says you know, a number and then score, that just means whatever that number is times 20. That's what that means. So. You know, 4 times 20 here is 80. So we have 80 and 6 years old. So that's what the score means. Whatever number comes in front of it, you just times it by 20. So 4 times 20, 80 and 6 years old. So he's 86 years old at the time that Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. And that is an event that takes place in this chapter. We'll go over that in just a moment. But I want you to flip back, if you will, quickly to Genesis 12 so you can get an idea of the timeline of Abram's life and where we are at this particular point in Genesis 16. 
in Abram's life. So look at Genesis chapter number 12. I want you to look at verse number 4. Genesis chapter number 12, verse number 4 says this, And Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old, <coughs> excuse me, when he departed out of Haran. Now, if you remember in Genesis 11 at the very end is when Abram was called. Well, Abram was called, not his father, but we know that his father, Terah, took Abram and Lot and, and all of them, and they went into Haran, and they stayed there until Terah died. And then Abram, which he should have been obedient prior to that, then Abram was obedient, and they left Haran, and then he went into the land of Canaan immediately at that time. So we have him 75 years here. So 75, and then jumping to Genesis chapter number 16, he is 86 years old. So we have Abram living in Canaan for roughly of 10, 11 years. They round numbers like we had saw last week in our Bible study. So he's right around in the land of Canaan. He's been there for right around 10 or 11 years by the time we get to Genesis chapter number 16. Now we're going to begin reading here now in Genesis chapter number 16, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bare him no children. And she had in handmaid an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. And Sarah, I said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. Verse number one, I want to point something out here, is that you know it, it tells us that she had, talking about Sarai, she had in handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Hagar. Now, she's referred to as a handmaid here, but if you go to Genesis chapter number 21, she's called a bondwoman. So she's some sort of servant. She's in servitude, and later on actually refers to Sarai in this same chapter as her mistress. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but, but uh, you know the, the, the abbreviations MR, which now we refer to as Mr., that was not originally Mr., it was originally in the past, master. And the missus used to be mistress. And it was actually a reference to someone being in servitude and it being a master or mistress. She's called a mistress here later on. God refers to Sarai as Hagar's mistress because she is in subjection unto her. Because she is a bondwoman unto you know, uh, Sarai. Now, uh, one, one thing that's very interesting how we can put the pieces together of Abram's life. Notice of what nationality Hagar is from. Where? Egypt. Now, if you go back just to Genesis chapter number 12 again, where we were, I want you to look at verse number 16. Now, Genesis 12 was where uh, Abram went into Egypt. He told Pharaoh and all of them that, that Sarai was his sister, which was half true, but he lied partially trying to be deceitful, right? So, while, you know, Pharaoh had taken Sarai, he's treating Abram well because he's related in some way to Sarai. He's interested in Sarai. Well, notice what it says in, in verse number 16. It says this, And he entreated Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep. So these are things that Pharaoh, which is where? Egypt gave him. He had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses. And camels. Go back to Genesis chapter number 16. So the likelihood of, uh, you know, uh, what's most likely of when Abram acquired Hagar is probably when he was in Egypt. Him and Sarai went down into Egypt. He was just in Egypt before that. You know, it doesn't speak of his wealth until this point, really. So I believe that he became wealthy while he was in Egypt from Pharaoh. And, and then, uh, you know, uh, because of that, or at that time, one of the maidservants that he was given most likely was Hagar, which is an Egyptian. So that makes perfect sense. So you just study your Bible, you can kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together here. It becomes much more clear. So, uh, so we see that she is an Egyptian. She is a bondwoman or a handmaid. Look at verse number two. It says this, And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Now this is significant, of course, because just in the chapter prior, God is promising that he's going to multiply Abram's seed. Now they're, they're getting, you know, uh, 
quite old. I didn't. I can't remember. I know that that, that Sarah or Sarai is is right around ten years younger than Abram. I didn't look up. I can't remember exactly her age at this time, but she's right around, like I said, ten years younger. But Abram is eighty six years old at this point. So he received the promise roughly like fifteen years before this, and he's been for ten years, you know, in the land of Canaan after this promise was given to him. Obviously, he just you know, got saved like we saw in the last chapter. But they're waiting, they've been waiting because of this promise for roughly 15 years since they've heard that ultimately God will give them a son. Sarah's getting old. Sarah is getting old. She's in her 70s. And Abram is 86 years old and she's starting to wonder, you know, God's not giving me a child. God has restrained me from bearing. One thing that that shows is that she understands that God is the one that opens and closes the womb. One thing that you can see from that, of course, is he says that God restrained me. The one thing that is very interesting, though, of her philosophy, the way that she's thinking here that I want to point out is, she says, in Sarai, it says, in Sarai, I said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. So why is Sarah so concerned now about having a child? Because they've received a promise that, the, you know, that of Abram's seed, it's going to be multiplied as the sand of the sea, right? So they're trying to figure out, why am I not able to have a child? Why are we not able to have children? And she, he, she even goes so far to say you know, that the Lord has restrained me. But you know what, what really starts happening here? And we, we know, of course, how Abram ends up going in unto Hagar, as we read at the end of the chapter, and everyone's probably familiar with. They still believed the promise, didn't they? They still believed that God was going to bless them with a child, didn't they? That's why they're following through with all this. But do you know what they started doing? They started going back and basically reinterpreting what God had said, weren't they? What you have is God telling them originally, hey, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you with this, with this child, right? You know, Abram is married to Sarai, right? Of course, you know, the, the, what, is the, what is the clear, you know, uh, uh, you know, where is the child going to come from? It's very clear, of course, from Abram and Sarai, right? I mean, it's very, very clear. Time goes by and they start wondering, why am I not having a child? Where is this child that I'm going to be blessed with? What is going on? Their faith starts to lapse, I'm sure, where they're wondering, why am I not having this kid? You know, time goes by longer and longer. You know, they're getting frustrated, I'm sure. Fifteen years. And they're like, God said that he was going to do this. Do they still believe it? They do. But then they go back to the word of God, and what do they do? They reinterpret it. And they're like, you know what? You know, we're going to receive this child. Maybe we're supposed to get the child through Hagar. Through the Egyptian woman. Look at verse number three now. Well, it tells you at the end, of course, and Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So there, of course, we get another uh, reference to the timeline. And gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife. Verse four, and he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived... And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Now, like I said, at this point, I believe that it is still very clear that Abram and Sarai believe the word of the Lord, don't they? They believe that it was true that God was going to provide them with a seed, right? That God was going to give them a child and that was going to multiply into the sand of the sea or into the stars of heaven as many as, right? It's going to be innumerable. But then they stop and they go back and they look. And what do they do? They end up reinterpreting God's word. <laughs> Excuse me. Or reinterpreting the Bible. And I believe a good application of this, when I was reading this today, this, this dawned on me. A good application of this would be, you know, uh, people looking at the Bible and coming up with different interpretations on things. And really what popped into my mind are, you know, people that will believe in dispensationalism. Or people that believe in hyper-dispensationalism. Even to the point where they think that people were saved differently in different periods of time. Now, I believe there are numerous people, that many people, and that you can be saved if you believe that salvation is different in different periods of time. 
What your salvation depends upon is what you are trusting in. Amen. That's what salvation, that's what matters. You're not going to be judged about what you thought about some other time period. Right. You're going to be judged about what you're trusting in. Right. Now, what you have Abram doing here is Abram receives the word of the Lord. And what's the clear you know, uh, uh, you know, message from God to begin with? That the child's going to come from him and Sarai, right? But you know what? He starts, time starts going on, 10 years pass by, you know, 15 in, in total, and he starts to become confused, doesn't he? He's wondering what's going on. They still believe the promise that was given. They still believe God's word, don't they? But then they just start kind of reinterpreting it. Notice how they have a totally different interpretation on how this promise is going to be fulfilled. It's a perfect example of some people, how they'll look at the Bible and have a totally different interpretation. But did they still believe God's word? They did. Just because, don't get this attitude that you have the right interpretation on everything in the first place. That your every interpretation that you have is 100% right. You know, obviously there are things that we can be dogmatic about. There are things that we can be sure about. But you should not be dogmatic about everything in the Bible. And not only that, you should not be dog, you know, you should not have this attitude that if people don't have your interpretation, they're just not saved. On every doctrine. If somebody, you know, that just means they don't believe the word of God if you don't, you know, believe it exactly like I believe it. And that's what a lot of people will say. If you don't believe, you know, this, that, no, you just don't believe the Bible. Did, okay, so did Abram and Sarai just stop believing at this point? They did, did they just not believe God's word? It's clear by reading the passage the whole reason why they're trying to find an alternate way to, for this promise to come true is because they did believe God. But you know what? They started, time went by, they're confused. It's just like somebody sitting down and reading their Bible. They come across some passages they can't understand. They try to reconcile things. And you know what? Sometimes people come to the wrong conclusion, don't they? Does that just mean, oh, they don't believe the Bible? That's foolishness. That's nonsense. Amen. You're not, you know, people get this attitude where they're like God, where they have the right interpretation about everything. If you don't believe everything like I believe it, you're not saved. That's stupidity. Right. That is such a prideful, stinking attitude. You're just a man, and I'm sure that you have so many chinks in your armor, it's not even funny. A lot of things that you think you're right about, you're wrong about. And people get this attitude where they're just, you know, their interpretation of everything has to be right. And you know what? Especially the foolishness of judging someone's salvation based upon the way they interpret the Bible. Now, if we're talking about salvation, that's a different story because that's what saves you, idiot. I'm talking about things outside of salvation. I'm talking about things outside of the gospel. Now, if someone misunderstands the gospel, well, yeah, they're not saved because the gospel is what saves you. Right. I mean, it's that simple. Right. But if someone you know, misunderstands something outside of the gospel, yeah, they're a man. You know, the works of the flesh, one of them is heresy. Right. People don't understand things sometimes for different reasons. Kind of like Abram here. Kind of like Abram and Sarai, where they start what? Reinterpreting God's word. Because that's what's going on. They heard God's word. They clearly understood it. That's why she's now saying, hey, I'm old. What is she saying? I thought the child was going to come from me. But you know what? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the child is supposed to come from, and how ridiculous is this? From, you know, Hagar, the Egyptian. Maybe that's what really God thought. It's a pretty ridiculous interpretation, isn't it? Maybe that's what God meant. It's stupid. Look at how, you know, how stupid of interpretation that is. But you know what? Every person has stupid interpretations of the Bible sometimes. Right. Me, you, many times we've, I've read things and I'll tell you something you know, uh, that used to happen commonly. When I got really super zealous about serving God, I would stay up. I mean, I, was, I don't sleep very much now anyways, but I remember when I was working in, you know, back in Cincinnati, I was working for Cincinnati Bell. I was like, like reading my Bible like all day, all the time. And I would stay up till like 3 or 4 in the morning where I'm getting loopy even to the point where like I'm getting real tired. And then I'd go to work. I'd wake up the next day at like 6.30 and go to work. I did that super commonly. And I remember so many times, like, waking up the very next morning and kind of going through all the things that I was, I was reading for, like, three hours. And I would go through some of the things that I thought and think, man, that was stupid. And I'd, like, follow this rabbit hole down, like, studying out things, and I was just wrong about stuff. If you study the Bible, 
You're, you're, you, you are fallible. You are going to have mistakes. You are not perfect. Right, right. Yes, even we have the Holy Spirit guiding us, but we still have free will. The you know, Holy Spirit doesn't like overpower us and force us to believe the right thing and guide us, you know, in, in, as far as, you know, it guides us, but it doesn't like force us. So the, the Holy Spirit guides us into all truth, but you don't have to follow. You should. But it doesn't force you to, you know, if I, I can guide you home tonight, but you know what? You can say, I'm not going to follow this guy anymore. He doesn't know where he's going. And take a right, right? And I'm just still going straight. I'm still guiding you. You're just not following me. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. It works exactly the same way. I have an example here where Abram is totally reinterpreting. Does he still believe the gospel? He still believes that seed's coming, doesn't he? He still believes that Messiah. He was given a lot less details than we were given today. But he still believed that that seed was coming, that God was going to you know, save him, that God was going to bless him, that the Messiah would come, didn't he? He still believed God, didn't he? But he got kind of wrong about maybe the specific details. Why? He still believed it, but he started trying to reinterpret things. Because he's a man. So don't get this attitude, well, if somebody else has a different interpretation than me, then they're not saved. That's ridiculous. You're not right about everything. And, you know, you know what's going to happen is if you start saying people aren't saved because of their interpretation of something and it's different than yours, you damn this person to hell and then you find out 10 years down the road like, oops, I was actually wrong about that. They were right all along. It's like that's why you don't get this kind of attitude. Hey, what we base someone's salvation upon is the gospel. Is what saves them in the first place. It's that simple. Doesn't, it, doesn't that seem simple? Doesn't it make sense that if what saves someone is believing the gospel, that we would go and ask them, hey, what do you believe you have to do to go to heaven? And then they tell us, and then we'll base it upon that. Doesn't that make the most sense? Right. Well, what do we do when we go out knocking on doors? What do you believe you have to do to get to heaven? I don't start asking them, hey, you know, now I'm, I got another question for you. How do you believe people were saved in the Old Testament? <laughs> you know, real quick, you know, is it pre-trib or post-trib or what are you? It's foolishness. Right. It's stupid. Right. That's dumb. Yeah, yeah, they're going to get to heaven and God's going to, you know, tell them, you know what? You are totally wrong. I am not three distinct persons. I'm one person right here. You're going to go to hell because of that. That's not going to damn someone to hell either. Right? right. right? You know, not going to get to heaven and, you know, we're wrong about whatever doctrine. Doctrines that are outside of the gospel, that don't attach to the gospel. There are things, are elements that you have to believe are part of the gospel. Like you have to believe Jesus is God. If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. If you don't believe Jesus is God, you're going to die in your sins. Right. You know, that's a part of the gospel. He's telling you you're going to die and go to hell. Therefore, that your salvation relies upon believing that Jesus is God. Right. But if you don't believe the right gospel, the message that, that is the good news that brings salvation, then you'll die and go to hell. But if you're wrong about something else outside of the gospel... That doesn't matter as right. far as salvation. Right. Yeah, we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. But here's the thing. That's not, gonna, that's not a deciding factor on whether or not you're going to go to heaven or not. We see Abram reinterpreting God's word at a time when he has little faith. And I'll tell you what I believe. I know many people that are hyper-dispensationalists, and I was taught hyper-dispensationalism right when I really started getting big into serving God, and I was right around 21 years old. I was taught this by my pastor, and, and uh, you know, I wasn't really sure what I believed at the time. I was just, you know, I never really read the Bible, and I, and I studied it out, and when I started reading the Bible, I started realizing I don't believe that the Bible teaches what I'm being taught as far as dispensationalism. And the more I studied my Bible, the more I heard him teach dispensationalism, and I listened to his answers, and I, and I noticed the pattern in which he was always bringing up dispensationalism. It was always being used as a crutch every time. And that's the reason why people buy into hyper-dispensationalism. You say, what do you mean by that? A hyper-dispensationalist will always you know, uh, bring up hyper-dispensationalism or that, uh, when I say hyper-dispensational, it's obviously someone that believes that salvation was different, right? Or salvation was different in different time periods, right? 
That's normally what a hyper dispensationalist is. Someone that believes that would say that, that people are saved differently you know, during the time when the Old Testament was, right? Or during right when Jesus sent the apostles out. They'll even point to that and say, you know, salvation was different right there. And the reason why they would do so is because they can't explain certain passages. They know that they're saved by grace through faith. They don't have to repent of their sins, eternal security. They understand and believe the exact same gospel as you. But then they say, well, people were saved differently during this time period. You say, oh, okay, prove that to me. You know what they'll do? They'll go to a hard-to-understand passage, maybe, or an obscure passage that they couldn't explain. Like Mark 16, uh, you know, verses 15 and 16, where the Bible, when Jesus is sending them out, and Jesus says, you know, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Right? And they say, well, see, you had to believe and be baptized. Obviously, the answer of that is the second portion of that, where he says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. So notice he didn't mention the not being baptized would damn you. What damned you was not believing. And it's true that if you believe and be baptized, you'd be saved. You would also you know, be saved if you believe and came to church. He mentions baptism because that's the very next thing, and it's very important that you should be being baptized. You know, we don't emphasize baptism as, as much, but you notice in the Bible, people are believing, and a lot of times, not always, they're getting baptized right, at, right afterwards. I just have the thief on the cross as a proof that you don't have to be baptized to be saved. There are many people you know, in the Bible that don't get baptized, and the Bible's clear they're saved. But they'll look at that and they'll say, see, you know, you, at this time you had to believe and be baptized. It's like, you know, why do you believe that? Well, look at Mark 16, 15, 16. Excuse me, explain. I actually had my pastor hand me a dispensational chart one time that, draw, that drew out all of the different dispensations, the time periods, and he had verses that supported what they believed was required for salvation or necessary for salvation during these different time periods. And he said these exact words to me. If you can explain those verses to me, I'll no longer be a dispensationalist. So what was he really... Do you think there was anything that could have convinced him that the Bible wasn't true? Do you think there was anything that could have convinced him that salvation, as far as his salvation, what he was believing in, that salvation wasn't by grace through faith? No. But do you know what he said to me? If you can convince me that those verses aren't, you know, aren't teaching works, you know, I'll, I'll reject dispensationalism. So what was the only reason why he believed it? Because he couldn't explain those verses. But he wouldn't have rejected salvation. He would never have rejected that salvation is by grace through faith alone. Any of that. But he, know, he, he had these verses that he couldn't explain. So you know what he did? He reinterpreted them. He couldn't find, he couldn't understand them. So what did he do? He's like, well, I know that the Bible's true. Like Abram and Sarah, I know God's word's true. But I just, I, I can't explain this. Why am I not having a child? You know what they say? I know Genesis to Revelation is true, but I can't explain these verses in Ezekiel. I can't explain these verses when it comes to some of the verses in the law. Why does it seem like people are saved, you know, by, you know, keeping the law? I know I'm saved. I know that I believe the right gospel. I know that I'm saved by grace through faith alone, but these verses are confusing. So you know what they do? They reinterpret these verses and they say, well, you know, maybe this is a system. And maybe during other times, maybe other people were saved this way. But you know what? That person's not judged on that. You know what they're judged about? These are things that came after their salvation. These are things that were taught after they had already believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they go to church and somebody says, hey, let me explain this to you. Let me teach this to you. Or they get a Schofield reference Bible and they read the Schofield Bible and then they see all the trash notes in that. Right. These, these are things they're taught after they're saved. It's foolishness to say that a person, you know, can't believe wrong doctrine when the Bible says the work of the flesh is heresy. That's stupid. You know what it is? It's a prideful attitude. Because you know what you're saying is, well, I have all my doctrine straight. You know, but, but you, if you believe things like that, you just must not be saved. It's like, based upon what? What are they basing on? Their doctrine. Right. I mean, what else do they have to point to? It's arbitrary. They're, it's coming from their own mind. They're the final authority on who's saved and who's not then. Yeah, think of a mess we'd be in if everybody's just walking around. You don't believe, you know, you don't believe like me? Unsaved, saved, unsaved. It's ridiculous. And where do you draw the line? Because nobody believes the same on every doctrine. Right. It's foolishness. Yeah. It's not in the Bible. 
You know, people interpret the Bible differently sometimes. I'm not talking about the gospel. I'm talking about any passage. I may stand up here as your pastor and I might have a different interpretation than you. That's fine. That doesn't mean you don't believe the Bible. That doesn't mean I don't believe the Bible. Just like Abram, just like Sarai, it's stupid. Quit having these stupid, just these prideful attitudes about things where everybody's unsaved they don't believe exactly like I believe. It's not biblical. Amen. It's not biblical. We see Abram, we see Sarai as a perfect example of even them having the right interpretation and they change to the wrong interpretation. People can do that too. Do you know how? They get taught something false. So we need to understand that just because somebody doesn't have your interpretation of God's word doesn't mean they don't believe the Bible. They just may misunderstand something. They may just be trying to make the, you know, the Bible say something that would make sense in their mind because they do believe that it's true. And they're just trying to make sense of it. So have patience with people Amen. when they're learning the Bible. Be merciful to people, especially new people. You know, if somebody comes into our church... They may not understand the Bible. You know, it may take them a while. And they're studying the Bible. There might be people here that don't understand the Bible exactly like you. We're all on different levels. Okay? So you need to have patience with people and let them, give them, you know, give them grace while they're learning. And help them and try to teach them. And you know what? If they don't agree with you, that doesn't mean they're not saved. That's silliness. They'll come around, hopefully, if they have the right heart. But even if they didn't, that doesn't mean they're not saved. It matters if you believe the right gospel. Amen. Another thing I want to point out here is... Uh, like I said a moment ago, I kind of alluded to this, that Abram and Hagar, they should have been patient. They should have waited on the Lord, shouldn't they have? And that's what was going on here. They weren't waiting on the Lord. They wanted things to happen immediately. And then, they, and then at that point, that's why they started getting this wrong interpretation. So you know what they should have done? You know what you should do is if you start to have, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, not necessarily doubts, if you will, because they still believe that God's word was true, but if you start to become confused about something, you know what you should do? Go back to the source. Go back to God's word. You know how easy this would have been to overcome? Just start, what did, what did God tell me? Just start quoting it. Look at it. Pick it up and look at it, and then it'll make it that much harder for you to have the wrong interpretation. Just go back to the Bible and believe the Bible. Believe God for what he said. That's all they had to do was believe God for what he said. The other thing I want to point out is here in verse number 3, it says this, And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Now, I've heard many people say that Hagar was Abram's concubine. Who's heard that before? Right? I looked, and I couldn't find a verse that actually says that Hagar is, is Abram's concubine. Does anybody know where a verse is located? Where, the, where it actually says the words that Hagar is his concubine. I looked up concubine and concubines. There's a time later in like Genesis chapter maybe 35 where it says that Abram gave, you know, he gives, uh, and it may be a little bit earlier than that actually, but Abram gives to his son Isaac, you know, everything. And then, but it says, it, or maybe, you know, he gives him something specific. I can't remember. Maybe he gives everything. What, what does it say? What chapter is it? Uh, Genesis 25. 25. That's why I was confused. Okay. Genesis 25. Let's go to Genesis 25 real quick. What's the verse? Six. Six. So this is the closest thing that you could use for that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, you know, teach you something along these lines in the first place anyway. But it says in 25, 6, it says, but under the signs of the concubine. Sorry, let's read five first. And Abram gave all that he had. So it is everything. All that he had unto Isaac, verse 6, but unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son. Now, what is the, what is the clear you know, uh, implication from this? Number one is that the only real wife that he had was who? Would have been Sarai. That's what it seems to be, right? That's the clear you know, uh, implication from this. Then when you read in verse number 6, it says, But unto the sons of the concubines. So it sounds like from just reading this that he has a wife, and then he has what? Concubines. Well, look at chapter 20, 25, verse 1. Then again, Abraham took a what? A wife. A wife, and her name was Keturah. Okay, so did Abram, or Abraham like he's referred to now, only have one wife? He did not, did he? Right after this, though, it said, <clears throat> Abram gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines. So we can see that he has one woman that is referred to primarily as his wife, but then there are other women that are referred to as what? 
concubines. But according to the Holy Spirit, these women can also be referred to as a wife. From 25, chapter 25, verse 1, Keturah is also called a wife. Now, in Genesis 16, and I believe Genesis 20 is the only other time that, that Hagar is really talked about a lot. I searched and I couldn't see anywhere else where she's specifically referred to as a concubine. But I grew up my entire life hearing that Hagar was Abram's concubine. And I was also taught that Hagar was not Abram's wife. I had heard that so many times that Hagar, the Egyptian bondwoman, or the maidservant as she's also referred to, that she was not Abram's wife. Well, look at Genesis 16, verse 3 at the very end there, the last clause, the last statement. It says this, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife, to be his wife. So what was Hagar? She was a wife. Now, if we look at it, we compare 25.1 to 25.6, we can see that, yes, Abram had you know, a wife, which was Sarai, and you could refer to all of the other women as concubines. But we saw from chapter 25, verse 1, that Keturah was also his wife. But only Sarai was referred to as a wife later on because a concubine is a lesser wife. Now, I'm going to show that to you, that these are used interchangeable very clearly. I want you to turn to the book of Judges. I want you to see how concubine and wife are used interchangeably in the Bible. <clears throat> this is Judges chapter 19. Judges chapter number 19. Whoops. Right after the book of Joshua, Judges chapter number 19. Judges get there myself. I'm in a little trouble. Judges chapter number 19. Why don't you look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah. So two times she's been referred to as a concubine. Last statement there in verse 2. It was there four whole months. Now I want you to look at verse 3. And her, what? Husband arose and went after her. If the, Who's speaking in verse number 3 also? The Holy Spirit is. This, is. this is inspired scripture. It was referred to, or she was referred to first as a concubine, but then the Holy Spirit also refers to her as a, as a wife, obviously comparing husband and wife and understanding that a husband, obviously, and a wife... Of course, go together. Um, if, you, if you look down at verse 4, it says, in the beginning of verse 4, it says, And his father-in-law, the damsel's father. Notice again, father-in-law. So, in law, it's referring to a covenant. That's what makes someone a wife or a concubine. There, there is a difference between a concubine and a wife. I agree. I agree with that. There obviously is a difference when you compare the two. There is obviously a higher regard to someone that is just a wife. That's why the Bible, the Holy Spirit says in 25, verse 5 and 6, that unto Isaac he gave everything, but unto the women that were his concubines, expressing that he had a lower degree of care. That's why the Bible uses there the word concubine. So a concubine is this. A concubine is a lesser wife, according to the Bible. They are both wives, a, you know, just the wife, you know, a normal wife like we know it today, but then also there is what the Bible referred to as a concubine, and used interchangeably with that is, is wife. But comparing scripture to scripture, we can see that it's a lesser wife. It's a wife that is just not treated the same. Go back to Genesis 16, and we saw that as proof in Genesis 16, 3. It says, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. Verse number 4 says this, And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Now I want you to keep your hand here. Go to Matthew. We'll do this. I want to do this one quickly. Go to Matthew chapter number one. There are a lot of people that will teach that, you know, and I've heard this from many people. I know Peter Ruckman is one person that teaches this. But a lot of people will teach that a, a man and a wife, or a man and a woman, I'm sorry, become husband and wife at the moment of sensual relationship. That that just automatically makes you husband and wife. That's foolishness. That's nonsense. I want you to think about this. There would be no such thing as fornication. Yeah. It would be impossible to, to commit fornication. Do you know why? As soon as the act begins, you're married. Right. 
Right. That's foolishness. It makes no sense. It's silly. Right. But the proof, number one, where we were, you don't have to flip back exactly if you're not there right this second. In Genesis 16, 3, it says that, that she gave her to, to her to Abram, I'm sorry, and gave her to her husband. Sarah gave her to Sarah's husband. Abram to be his wife, and then it says, and he went in unto Hagar. So she is his husband. You know, uh, she is, I'm sorry, she is, yeah, his wife, goodness sakes. And then, yeah, that didn't seem right in my mind. I was transposing the thought for the word. You know how you do that sometimes? I saw a husband and the same wife. You know, yeah, but she she was already his wife, and then after that, he went in unto her. Referring to the relationship. Well, further proof is this. I want you. This is the best proof. Because <clears throat> Mary was, of course, you know, uh, it was the miraculous conception, right? She conceived while she was what? A virgin. Well, while, before Jesus is even born, the Bible says, and look at Matthew 1.18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. So it says espoused here, right? But if you keep reading now, I want you to look at verse... Uh, 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary, what? Thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So Mary is referred to as Joseph's wife when the Bible is, you know, couldn't be more emphatically clear prior to that in verse number 19 that they hadn't come together, or verse 18 that they hadn't came together yet. They had not had relationship, but then the angel comes and says, Fear not to take unto thee Mary, thy wife, according to the, to the angel. Of course, and we know that that is true, what the angel is speaking there. This is a messenger, messenger of the Lord at that time. So, someone, that, that is, these are two separate issues. That's why fornication is the act of two people that are not married coming together, which is, of course, sinful. The reason why that, that the concubine was called a father in the law was because there was a covenant that took place with the concubine. But it was a wife that was treated, you know, on a lesser level than his main wife, if you will. So look back at uh, Genesis 16 again. We saw in verse number 4, we'll read that one more time. <clears throat> we need to speed through this chapter now. He went in unto Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised. In her eyes. Now, obviously, this is a horribly wicked thing that went on here. What, what Abram did here was very, very sinful. What Sarai was the one that dreamed up this thought, and then it says that, that Abram hearkened unto the voice of his wife. So both of them are equally at fault in this situation. And, you know, he ends up going in and committing adultery. Now, it doesn't matter whether or not he made a covenant with her or not. The Bible is very, very clear. I want you to turn to Mark. Let's, let's, this is going to be the, probably the last reference that we turn. No, we have one more, but this will be the last reference. Or go to Matthew. Matthew is where we'll go. I know exactly where it is in Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter number 19. Look at Matthew chapter number 19. People will look at... Uh, people will look at uh, you know, uh, people in the Old Testament, heroes of the faith of the Old Testament, and they'll see them having multiple wives, and they'll try to justify polygamy. They'll try to say that it's all right for people to have multiple wives, or maybe it was okay for them at that time. Well, Jesus addresses that exactly, that it was wrong in the Old Testament in Matthew chapter number 19. He says that clearly. Look at verse number 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? For every cause, saying to divorce his wife for any reason. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. And watch what it says. And they, and they twain shall be one flesh. Notice, two. That's God's plan. The two people are to be one flesh. It's supposed to be one man, one woman, one union between those two. And then it says in verse 6, Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder, saying, Divorce is never okay. Translation. Amen. Look at verse 7. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put it away? Verse 8. He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, 
committeth adultery. And whoso, and whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. So I, we read on a little bit further because this whole context was about divorce. But what we saw there in verse number 6, you know, he's speaking in the context of divorce, but he also gives you the little nugget of truth, which of course de demolishes the teaching of polygamy, where he says that from the beginning... He made them male and female, and he says that the purpose was that there was two, and that they would be what? One. God preached against, and God you know, gave the commandment against the kings to multiply wives. It's, it, you know, they, they are not to have more than one wife. What's multiplication from if you have a wife now? Having one more. That would be multiplying wives, wouldn't it? What's one time? What? One times two would be two. That's all that it would, that it would take. You just add one. That would be, you would be multiplying by just adding one. Let me word it that way. If you just added one wife, you just multiplied how many wives that you had, didn't you? So that means it's wrong. It's not okay. God said in the very beginning, he made them male and female. And for this reason, he said, and he goes on, they, they twain shall be what? One flesh. That was the, the plan from the beginning. God didn't create Adam with six wives. God didn't make, you know, take five ribs and make these five women. He made one woman. And then you're supposed to have one wife. So what they did in the Old Testament was sinful. What went on here was very sinful. I'm not going to be able to get to a lot of the stuff that I wanted to get to because I spent so much time on some of these other verses. Go back to Genesis chapter number 16. Genesis chapter number 16. Turn the air conditioning back on. Genesis chapter number 16. It says in um, verse number 6, And Abram said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way of Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's, Sarai's maid, whence camest thou? And whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarai. And that's like her boss, basically, who's a woman. That's what that means. Verse 9, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress. And watch what it says. And submit thyself under her hands. Now I'm going to read to you, because I already told you we're only going to turn to one other place, so I don't want to bear false witness. I'm going to read you here from 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 18. Quickly, the Bible says this, Servants, be subject to your masters. It's like mistress or a master. With all fear. And then he says this. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. And what more of a perfect example than Genesis chapter number 16. I think of that verse every single time I read through my Bible right here. I, I think of that as the most perfect verse because you actually see God intervening after it tells you that Sarai dealt hard with her. To the point where she's crying, she flees away, and she doesn't even want to live there any longer, right? And then God comes to Sarah, or I'm sorry, to Hagar, and says to her, return to thy mistress, and then watch this, and submit, the exact same word, thyself under her hands. The Bible tells you to submit unto your bosses, to submit unto your masters, your lords, whatever word you want to use, even unto the froward. You know what that means? Someone that is perverse, someone that doesn't treat you. Right, just like how Sarai was not treating Hagar right. But you know what God wanted to do? You know, the same God of the New Testament is the God of the Old Testament. So you see him giving the same exact advice that he gave in 1 Peter chapter 2 here in Genesis chapter number 6. And even though she, she treated you wrongly, you need to go back. You need to go back there and submit yourself under her. So if you have a boss, men at work, and they don't treat you well, you know what you need to do? Quit. No, I'm just kidding. You need to... Be obedient unto them, even unto the froward. Even if they treat you poorly, even if they you know, scream at you, right? Does that sound familiar? You need to be obedient unto them and submit yourselves unto them. That's what you're commanded to do right. as Christians. That's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. Amen. Even if your boss treats you bad, you know what you do? You take it. You, you let him yell at you, and then you do whatever he tells you to do. You know, if he gives you a commandment and he's cussing you out, you know what you should do? Do whatever he's telling you to do. It's that easy. Just what? Submit yourselves. You know, you're supposed to submit to your masters, to your boss. And that's what God told uh, uh, here Hagar to do. And you know what? She ends up being blessed in the long run because of this. I want you to look at the next verse, verse 10. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Verse 11. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, 
and shall call his name Ishmael. So we see this is prophesied what he is going to be called, and his name is Ishmael. Because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. That's what Ishmael means, that the Lord heard her affliction, the Lord heard her pain, right? What's very interesting about that is Ishmael today, what do people teach? Uh, who is the descendants of Ish Ishmael? The Muslims. the Muslims. Notice that that is, uh, uh, so if that's true, notice that it's because God blessed Hagar. God doesn't only care about one ethnicity. That actually speaks, if you go back and read who Ishmael is, that speak, that's a blessing from God. That God blessed them. And, 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 yeah, they've turned away, of course, down the line, if they are of the seed of Ish Ishmael. They've turned away unto a false god, but that, that seed ultimately was also blessed by God. Not in the same way, of course, that the Christ would come of, but he, God promised that he would multiply that seed, didn't he? That shows all the way back, as far back as you can go, based on the founding of the nation of Israel, God still cared for the child that was the brother of Isaac, Ishmael, just as much. And you know what, God, when she ran away, she, he, God said, hey, name the child Ishmael. Why? Because the Lord heard your affliction. And he, wants to, he wants to help her. He's going to give her a blessing. You see, God's not just this, you know, respecter of persons where he only cares about these specific people over here. Go to, this is the last place we're going to turn. Go to Galatians 4. We're going to wrap up here in just a minute. Galatians chapter 4 uh, actually references, uh, you know, what we just read. It, it quotes from here as well. And this is actually, according to the Bible, that there's symbolism. God included this story and everything that's, in, and, uh, that, that's contained in Genesis 16 here, where, where Hagar flees away and the child being born, he actually takes it, includes it, and then he uses it as symbolism to get a point across. The Bible refers to it as an allegory here in the New Testament. I want you to look here in verse number 22, Galatians 4, verse 22. It says this, For it is written that Abraham, sorry, back up to 21, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, that's of course Hagar, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Verse 24, which things are an allegory. That means that it was, a, it was, a, it was symbolic. For these... So those two are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai. What happened in Mount Sinai? The law. the law was given. And then it says this, which gendereth, that means like brings about or creates, to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. And then it says, verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. So notice the two represent covenants. One represents the covenant of grace. One represents the covenant that was given, the promise that was given to Abram, doesn't it? Which is how? How are we saved? By grace, through faith, right? But then we look at, you know, uh, the other covenant. Let me find something here. When we look at the other covenant, if someone wants to get to heaven by you know, Mount Sinai, what do they do? It's by the works of the law. Or another way to put that is the works of the flesh. What you see, you know, Abram doing there, which, which you know, the Bible tells us that he was fully persuaded. His trust never started, he never started trusting in his own works. But this symbolized a person that was doing so. What Abram actually started doing there was trying to take matters into his own hands, wasn't he? When you really start thinking about it. You think about a person that's trying to get themselves to heaven. What are they doing? Are they, you know, are they taking all of their, you know, their, let's say their destiny and just handing it to God? Is that what they're doing? No, they have all of it, don't they? They're the ones that they're going to carry themselves there, aren't they? They're going to work their way there, aren't they? What, what is going to be the strength of that? What is going to be what brought them there? Their flesh, right? It, it's the works of the flesh. You know what you have Abram and Sarai doing? The works of the flesh. What you see them doing is trying to take matters into their own hands as opposed to trusting God because what would have happened if they would have waited? What does happen? They would have been blessed. And they were blessed. 
they would have just waited a little bit longer if they would have just continued, you know, uh, you know, waiting on God and having patience in God and, and referring back to God's word and not trying to reinterpret things, right? What would have happened? They would have just had the child. Isaac would have been born, but, but you know what they tried to do? They tried to take matters into their own hands, didn't they? That's, that's you know, uh, uh, that symbolizes the works of the flesh. And you know who it pictures specifically according to Galatians chapter number 4? It pictures the Jews today. That's what the Bible says in Galatians chapter number 4. You know, what makes you actually a child of Abraham is we are all children of God by faith. By faith, we're all children of God by faith. And it's the same faith that Abraham had. You know, if we have the faith of Abraham, then we're a child of Abraham. Because what actually saved Abraham, what actually made Abraham special, was not where he descended from. It was the fact that he trusted in God. That was the only thing that was really, truly special about Abraham. That was why God ended up using him. That's why in the New Testament we see his faith being praised. It has nothing to do with where he came from. It has nothing to do with who his father is. That is not why he was special. He was given this great covenant because what? He believed the Lord. We see his faith being tested when he goes to Genesis 22. We'll read about this, of course, with Isaac. And what does he have? You know, just a, a, a magnificent story of what? His great faith. That's what makes Abraham great. Just like, you know, John the Baptist said, think now when the Pharisees come and they're the Jews, they're the, you know, they think that they're just the chosen ones, right? Exactly the same as the Jews today. There's no difference. And he says, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. It means, it doesn't mean, this translation, that doesn't mean Jack where you came from, buddy. Right. That doesn't make you a child of Abraham. Right. And actually, all of those people that are living in Israel today, all of the people that are, if even if they are, which they probably are to some degree, physical descendants from Abraham, it means nothing. In God's eyes, they're not a son of God, and they're not truly a child of Abraham. Because what really matters is whether they're trusting in God. Right. The God that gave Abraham that exact covenant, they don't even believe in. Right. So what does it even mean? The God that actually said, hey, here's the covenant, Abraham. This is, this is the, the, you know, the covenant that's going to make you know throughout the Bible, isn't it? The Abrahamic covenant, which is the gospel they don't even believe in that God and they don't even believe that covenant. That's what Abraham is so well known for was because he was, you know, we start seeing the gospel in more, more clearly being preached to Abraham. And the Jews today reject it. They reject, what they do is they reject the God of the Bible. That's what they do. They don't truly, now that's an example of someone that actually doesn't believe the Bible. That's an example of someone, because the Bible's clear, if you don't have the son, you don't have the father. You know, that's what the Bible teaches. So they don't have, they, if you believe, Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you believe me, for he loaded me. You believe not his writings, you know, how can you believe my words, he says. So, you know, they don't really believe the Old Testament. They don't really believe Moses. They don't believe Abraham. And they're not the children of Abraham in God's sight. What really matters, go back to Genesis 16, we're going to read the rest of this. What really matters is whether or not you have the faith of Abraham. If you're believing in the God of Abraham, who is the Christ, he is, that same God was born, and they rejected that God. He came down as a man, and they rejected him, and they still reject him to this day. And that's what actually matters. <clears throat> so we see that even all the way back to Ishmael, ethnicity didn't matter. It didn't matter whether it was Isaac, you know, at that point, or Ishmael. They both were offered salvation. Of course, Isaac would ultimately bring forth the, uh, the Christ, but... God cared about Ishmael as well and Hagar. Look at verse 12. And he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every, against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto her, Thou God seest me. For she said, Have I also here looked after him that seeth me? Wherefore the well was called Beer Leheroi, Leheroi, Beer Leheroi, Behold, it is between Kadesh and Bered, and Hagar bare Abram a son, and Abram called his son's name, which Hagar bare Ishmael. 
And Abram was four score and si uh, four score and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the, uh, the clarity of the New Testament that can shed so much light on the passages that we read in the Old Testament. Dear Lord, we thank you that salvation is not chosen by our race, by our ethnicity, things that we cannot control. Um, we're also thankful that salvation is not by the works of the flesh, which we know would be impossible, dear Lord. We thank you that salvation is by grace through faith. We thank you for the Bible. Just continue to uh, bless our Bible studies in the future, dear Lord, the book of Genesis. We love you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.